Well, I've been saying uh, er <laughs> by error that the we were in event 25, but actually, chronologically, um, I skipped a whole section and uh, we're really in event 23 when we looked at all of those things that were in John. Uh, and uh, so here's the correct chronology of this whole thing. They had the Passover in the upper room and during that Passover there was the foot washing. There was the telling Judas that he was going to be betraying Jesus. There was the warning to Peter that he too would deny Christ. Uh, and then there was the teaching of John. So hope that that chronology will help you. Uh, what happened was I jumped all the way ahead to the arrest in the garden with Peter and the sword. And I just love that story so much. And the fact that Peter's like me, he jumps ahead without getting an answer from Jesus. Should I swipe with the sword? And Jesus has to clean up the mess. But in any case, uh, the correct chronology is the Passover up in the upper room, uh, then the foot washing, then uh, the Judas uh, being told that he's going to betray Jesus, Peter being warned that he's going to deny Jesus, and then the teachings of John, which we've been doing. And, and now we come to John 17, and it's a called a priestly prayer because it's Jesus probably in the garden uh, praying these things, and it's revealed to us. It's three parts. He prays for himself. He prays for his disciples. And then he prays for you and I. That's a beautiful prayer. And so I want to break it down into those three parts. And today we're going to take a look at Jesus' prayer for himself. Although in a lot of respects, uh, it is and it isn't. Uh, it's one of those paradoxical things. Uh, if you truly believe in the Trinity, and I do, uh, then he's praying for himself. If you look at the Trinity in three separate uh, personhood, if you would, uh, he's praying to the Father for his, the Son's benefit and the Father's benefit. So let's take a look. Verses 1 and 2, he says, lifting up his eyes to heaven. Uh, and so we, we find this uh, uh, out of this world kind of a, a thinking that the Father is in heaven, a separate place uh, from, from the earth. And he says, uh, so he he first of all is dealing with uh, his relationship and that's if you thought about the model prayer uh, of our Father which art in heaven that's exactly how he starts out with uh, uh, Father the hour has come uh, and he's talking about to accomplish the final goal that he was sent to do which was to die on the cross for our sins and then to rise to prove that he had the power over death. But in any case, we have that relationship as our Father, which art in heaven. It is Father, the hour has come, the relationship. And then we have the petition. He says, glorify the Son, that the Son may glorify thee. Uh, now that's really interesting. He says he wants to glorify the Father through the things that uh, he is glorified in. And then he goes on and says, you gave me the authority over all mankind that I may give. Now that understand is doesn't say that they may earn. It says that I might give eternal life. And then he says in verse three, and this is the eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ. Uh, so we, for, for whom you sent, so, so we find that uh, he identifies himself as part of the true God uh, and uh, that he wants to glorify the Father on earth uh, and accomplish the work that he has been given. And uh, he says, now glorify then me together with thyself uh, to glorify I had with thee before the world was to glorify and to have the glory that you and I had before the world even was. Now we got to test that, don't we? Uh, did Jesus Christ pre-exist, and is He God in the flesh? Well, if you go to Genesis 1:26, God said, "Let us make man in our image." Uh, there's a plural there. 
And that's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit going to create the heavens and the earth, and he's going to create man uh, out of the dust of the earth. Now, how do we know that? Let's take a look at the New Testament and John 1, verses 1 through 5. Now listen, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, if Jesus is the Word, if, if that's what we're looking at here, if Jesus is the Word, that then he was with God, let us make man in our own image, and the Word was God. Now we get the uh, three being uh, Godhead, uh, and we see he was in the beginning with God and all things came into being through him. Apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And let me just, so let me say that again. He was in the beginning with God and all things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And the light shines in the darkness, the darkness of the world, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, you say, well, that's, that's not quite enough to satisfy me that Jesus is God, was God, was in the beginning, even before he became flesh and dwelt here on earth. But then we have John 1.14 that says the word again, if they accept that as Jesus, became flesh, dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Now remember he said he'd restore the glory that we had before the beginning of the world. And we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is God in the flesh. He is part of the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He created everything before time was, before the world existed. And he now tells us, as he prays to the Father, as he goes to accomplish the work that he's given him, that he wants to restore the glory that they had together before the beginning of the world. It's a beautiful prayer for himself but to glorify God for the purpose of glorifying God in our eyes that we might know that we might know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life and that's my thought for the day God bless you and have a great day You know that you can know that you're going to heaven. Most people say, I hope so, but uh, the scriptures in the book of Romans make it very clear. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, that is, sin is anything that's displeasing to God, and we've all done things displeasing to God, so we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And God demonstrated his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's Romans 5, 8. So we are sinners, but Christ died for us. And then in Romans 5, 6, it says, while we were still helpless, that is, we couldn't do good enough works to earn our way into heaven. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, Romans 5, 6. We were helpless, but at the right time, Christ died for us. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. We all earned our wages, which is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, that means there's nothing we can do to earn it or deserve it. It's a free gift of God. It's by grace and grace alone. But that's not freedom to just continue in sin either. And the way that we receive it is in Romans 10 verse 9. If we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Well, I hope that you know for certain that you're going to heaven. I hope that you've turned away from sin and self, turned to Jesus alone, who gives by grace eternal life. 
And yes, it, there is some surrender involved, and yes, there is a, a turning away from sin, but that's not how we earn heaven. We don't earn it. We, des we get it from him as a gift, and that's what the scripture says clearly. It's by grace and grace alone. God bless you and have a great day.